Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about not giving up on God because God won't give up on you. So, I'm going to start out with this scripture. It comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 through 31. And it says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strengths. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So I'm going to talk about a, a, a testimony I didn't really speak about. So it's like a chain-breaking moment. I was ashamed of it, but through Christ I'm not anymore. So it was... Um, it was my junior going into my senior year, and I was so caught up in lustful desires and all that stuff, drinking, partying, and it was just a, cer a certain moment where I just felt so much conviction going through all that, and then I ended up graduating high school, got this job, started making thousands of dollars. I had my own apartment when I was 18, and I felt successful, um, I felt really successful, but I truly never gave God all his glory. And that, that was, it was wrong. Um, while I was doing that, and I started doing bad things in my apartment, and I felt the conviction, and then Jesus had his hand out and was like, be free from this bondage that you are in. And I was, and I feel like I, I was going back to my calling at, at a point when I was, I felt like I was going to give up on him. And I was deciding whether to go to my calling or stay where I was at. And out of nowhere, I was working and I got this call and it was from uh, Willie from Packerim. <laughs> and she was asking me if I was still interested. And I was just like, oh my, like I was in a, and I was a seed in a soil of sin and depression, and I felt like God was seeking me again when he was trying to seek me the whole time. And I, I like, listened, and I answered him. And I, was, I went back to um, just praying. I went back to doing all the stuff I was supposed to do originally, and I was so encouraged. And I went to my uh, peers at work and my coworkers, and I told them, like, this is my calling. And they were encouraging me and telling me, like, this is who you really are. This is how I thought you really are. And I was so happy, and there came a, a, a point in time where I was talking to my boss, and I told him, I want to go to school to be a pastor. I want to do everything that the Lord wants me to do and be obedient to God. He didn't listen to one thing I had to say and told me, I can give you thousands of dollars. I can give you a car, a nice car. I can get you a bigger house. You'll have a nice wife, whatever it is, if you just stay here with my company and I kind of felt like it was like Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. So I looked at him and God's like, Dion, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? It's either you're gonna choose me or you're gonna choose the world. And I thought in my mind, I was like, you come at me in the name of the world, I come at you in the name of the Lord. And I made a stand that day and told him that my faith is worth more than your money. And he didn't even feel offended about it. He understood what I was trying to say. And I was ready to uh, put my two weeks in, try to go to school and stuff like that. And I was still thinking about working and going to school at the same time. And it was my day off. And, I, and the whole time I was working, I never received one word. I didn't care. I worked on Sundays. I didn't go to church on Thursday. I didn't, I didn't really care. I was focused on money, which was never my value. I always valued Christ first. And I was ready to receive this word. God's like, go to this church, receive it. And I was so happy to just go back to that church. And I was, I was there on the way there. And I got a call from my manager, and he told me that you need to come in today. And I was like, what do you mean? It's my day off. I'm going to church. And I was sitting here back and forth arguing with this man, telling him, like, am I really arguing with someone about seeing God or trying to hear the word of God? And I told him, I was like, you know what? I'm going to worship my God. And he said, okay, go worship your God. We'll take care of your shift. And you're fired, basically, <laughs> for going to church <laughs> on my day off. So I feel like even some, even some of uh, 
some of you guys have felt that time where we had to choose between God and choose the world. There was times where many of you guys had to choose between drugs or partying or alcohol or any addiction you had or to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. And even if you haven't experienced this yet, 2,000 years ago, ooh, come on, Jesus. 2,000 years ago, even he, the son of God, was tempted. And this is what I'm going to show you. It's in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Jesus is in, tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came unto him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you that, you, that he, they will lift your ha hands so that you will not strike your foot against any stone. Jesus answered him again and said, it is also written, do not put your Lord, your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world in their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will just bow down to me. Jesus said unto him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and the angels attended him. So I felt like even a man like Jesus, the devil tried to tempt him through lust of the eyes, just like how he tried to tempt us through the lust of the eyes. Like it could be in a, a woman or it could be in a man. It can be into alcohol or drugs, something that fills us up, which is not of God. And I feel like in that message, if you haven't even experienced that, or if you have, what you're really supposed to say in the name of Christ, be gone, Satan. And I would rather, and I would say like, get out my mind, get out my body, get out my soul, get out my spirit, for if Christ is with me, who shall stand against me? Because the devil is only a defeated foe. And um, I have a video to show you guys on the perspective of the process that we go through. Okay. Um, sorry, people, there's some difficulties. Um, so, okay, so basically it's about um, a rebirth of the eagle. And what the eagle, may, the eagle at one point in his life is too weak to hunt. His talons are weak, his, his feathers are weak, and his beak is even weak. So he makes this choice in his life where he plucks out all the feathers off of him. He pulls out his talons and breaks his beak on a rock and wastes it for five months. And he goes through this process and, and the eagle forms and it, and it gets stronger again and it takes this test flight, which made him stronger than ever. I feel like that's kind of what we go through, being like suffering as a Christian. I feel like we are still getting our feathers plucked off. And it, and it's, and it's beautiful. Um, I want to talk about First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 19. It said, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come onto you to test you, as though something strange were to happen to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of the glory and God rests onto you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or a criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God and let that you bear that name. For it's time for his judgment to begin with God's household. And if he begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So then, those who suffer according to God's will will commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And to, out, okay, um, to get out of this, going through the pain, the process, and um, I'm a year free from any of the lustful desires, all that stuff, and... 
and I wanted to and I wanted to tell you guys if you are going through it or if you are in the middle of it how to get rid of that in the best way possible because I feel like when there was a time where I was I felt the conviction and I just said no I don't want to do this I kept going back to it and I feel like even if you had the spirit or the wrath of anger or addiction that you say no your no means nothing but by me pursuing an intimate relationship with God by me fasting by me praying your no means nothing but your yes to God means everything and in Matthew 16 24 it said then Jesus said unto his disciples whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me because it is so easy to speak about the word it is easy to speak about the cross, but it's a different experience when you have to live out the word and when you have to pick up the cross yourself and follow him. It's a completely different experience. And now that I spoke about do not give up on God because God won't give up on you and his unconditional love, Andy here is going to be speaking about do not quit on loving. How's everybody doing today? That was some worship we had, yeah? You guys like that? I hope so, because you know what? When the spirit moves, it doesn't care what you like. We might have been a little uncomfortable, you know? Things just, we're not used to that. But when God comes in and says, hey, I want you to do something different. We just do it, right? All right. You know, Dion talked about not giving up on believing because Jesus is always there. He believes, right? He believes in Christ, and Christ changed his life. Why? Anybody have an idea? Anybody? A clue? I'll take love for a thousand, Alex. God is love. We know that. The Bible tells us that in so many places. That's why he changed his life, because he's love. You know, give me here. This thing to the world represents a lot of hate and anger and division. That's not what this particular one means. This one stands for the love of Christ. I wear that for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's comfortable, to me anyway. I like it. But I wear it so that other people out there see that on me and they see that cross on my back and they know that they can come to me and tell me things and that I'm not going to condemn them. Because so many of us have a habit of condemnation, right? Yeah, oh, I heard some oohs out there. Romans 14 is one of my favorite chapters in one of my favorite books of the Bible. Because Romans 14 is one of those chapters that people just kind of skip over. I've heard so many pastors and so many preachers and so many messages that talk about correcting your brother and don't let him have wrong doctrine and this and that, you know, but they never come back and say Romans 14, any of it. Let's look at that for a moment. Do we have it up? Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. 
Now, we know that this is the Christian brother he's talking about. How do we know that? Because he's got faith, right? One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. That's some Shakespeare right there. But let's look at that for a moment. The one who eats is not to regard, the one who eats meat, is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat meat. And the one who does not eat meat is not to judge the one who does, for God has accepted him. Wait a minute, it says God has accepted him, and you can switch this around, and it reads the exact same and means the exact same. So does that mean that God loves you if you eat meat? Yeah, okay. Does that mean God loves you if you don't eat meat? Yes. So why are we condemning people that don't eat meat or do? And maybe it's not meat. Maybe it's something else you've got going on. Maybe, you know, just for an example, a friend of mine is a Calvinist, okay? I love him to death. He is, I just love this guy. Sometimes I'd love to strangle him, but no. But he and I can disagree on doctrine all day long. But at the end of the day, we still love each other. Just because he doesn't eat meat doesn't mean God doesn't love him. And Paul right here, speaking for the Lord, asks us a question in verse 4. He says, who are you? And you can read that, who am I to judge the servant of another? Everybody in here serves somebody, right? Whether it's yourself, and we'll work on that in a minute, or whether you serve Christ. Why should I judge you? You're not my servant. To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. There are some denominations out there that if you don't go to church on that day, you're wrong, you're going to hell. Wow. Is that like judgmental or what? It says the day doesn't matter. Your heart matters. God's heart matters. That's what he wants to see. He doesn't care whether you have a particular doctrine about meat or vegetables or what day you go to church. He cares about the condition of your heart. Verse 5, that second part of it, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. What does that mean? Does that mean, oh, I I think so, so it's okay? Well, in a way, kind of, yeah, that's exactly what it means. And if you think that sounds a little sacrilegious, there's a line down below that counters it that says, just because you think it's okay doesn't mean it is. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. Now, that's the key right there, for the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat. And still he gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Because we're his servants, right? Why are we his servants? Because he loves us. And because we want to love him back. Verse 10. Again, he comes back in your face. This, my other favorite book is James, because James is like right there. He's like, what? Yeah, it's like this, black and white. You don't think so? Read it. He says, but you, 
why do you judge your brother? This isn't even about somebody else's servant. This is your brother. Why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? You know what contempt is? Contempt is when you, like, that's contempt. Why do you judge your brother with contempt? Do you think he's so worthless that you can just spit on him? No. We will all, it says A-L-L, not some. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So it's not my job to go around and tell you that you're wrong. Because he's going to do that. It says so right here. You're going to bow a knee. You're going to praise God. Every, it says. Not most. Not some. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this. When he says determine, that word here means decide to do that. Make up your mind to do that. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this. Make up your mind to do this. Not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, meat, vegetables, motorcycles, whatever. <laughs> but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So if somebody's a vegetarian and they think meat is unclean, it becomes unclean because that's where their faith is. Their faith is in God and the word, not in things. But if that's the way they believe, then that's their faith and that's what's going on. Let's look at 16. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Who are you? Who are we all? We're children of God, right? He wants to make a change in you. He wants to do that. He's invited you here today to do that, to make a change. How many of us have judged someone from another church? Oh, wow, they sing weird, man. I don't know. I, maybe I should not hang with them. I don't know, those guys go to church on the wrong day. I'm kind of stuck here, right? That's not what it's about. This whole chapter, I want to do this last verse real quick. But he who doubts is contemned, condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. So if you're not believing in the word and you're not living that word and you're not putting that into action in your life, that's sin. Because you've had the word. You have it. How many of you have a phone? Who's got one of these? You have the word right here. In how many versions? Yeah, I can carry 50 versions right there. The main point of Romans chapter 14 is this. Just because your brother believes differently than you does not make him wrong. So why are you jumping on his back about it? We all have inside of us something that causes us to doubt others, doubt ourselves, doubt this, doubt that, wonder about God. It's that heart of stone. Doesn't he say that he'll remove that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh? How many of you want that heart of flesh? Jesus can give you that heart of flesh. Yes, he can. And we know he can. I, I was going to make a joke about Craig here. I was going to say, even Craig, you know, I mean, you know, but 
I, I don't want to pick on Craig. Craig's a, a wonderful guy, a wonderful brother. So I'm going to use me instead. I know that Jesus can change that heart because he did it in mine. I was not a friendly kind of guy. I've never been Mr. Smiles. I was not the kind of guy you wanted to hang out with. But now Jesus is in my heart. He's changed it. He's taken that stone out. He's replaced it with a heart of flesh. He's taken out the hate and the anger and all the things that a cut normally represents in the world. And he replaced it with his love. And we all want that love, right? Everybody that wants that love, raise your hand. Everybody around them, put your hand on them. And let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you came here today. We thank you that you've heard us. We thank you, Lord, that you know what's inside each one of us. You know that, that little pit, that stone that's inside each one of us that is born in the world and of the world. And we don't want to be in the world. We don't want to be of the world. And so, Father, we give that to you. We ask you to come in with that scalpel, that spiritual scalpel, and just slice it right out of us, Lord. Tear it right out and replace it with your heart. Replace it with something that glorifies you. A hug to my brother. I help him change a tire or carry some packages or I'm just there to help him when he needs it. Father, we just thank you for this. We thank you for all your incredible blessings in our lives. We thank you for your word today. And we do this in the name of Jesus, that magnificent name, that name of power, that name of glory, the name of beauty, the name of freedom. And all God's children say, amen. amen.